There's a great argument in our nation today whether we were built on Christian principles or not. And I read both sides, and, and I want to tell you that the, anybody who misses that this nation was built on Christian principles chooses to miss it because it's so very clear. It's so easy to find. And so I have a copy of the first textbook used in public schools. Notice I said public schools, not Christian schools. And this is a, actually a photo rendition of the, and the English is, of course, not like our English because the words were spelled a little differently. I loved it. In those days, you could spell words phonetically any way you thought. It was great. Things have changed. But here's the alphabet way that kids used to learn the alphabet in public school. Listen to this. In Adam's fall, we sinned all. That's the A. What are they teaching us? They teach the alphabet. Yeah, heaven define the Bible mind. You got your B. Christ crucified for sinners died. C. The deluge drowned the earth sound. D. That's the great flood. Elijah hid but ravens fed. E. The judgment made Felix afraid. F. I'm saying to myself, what would happen if we caught, taught our kids this today? This was, this was a primer for first, second, third, fourth grade, whatever somebody learned to read. This was the book they used. It's the oldest primer in the world, for the, in the United States, it was ever printed. It was first introduced in 1690, and it began to be publicly used in 1777, right after the Revolution. Do you, see, do you think that our nation wasn't found on Christian principles? Who do you think came over and landed in this nation to start it? They were spiritual people. And our land was found on these principles. And what we need to be careful of is that we don't throw them out. Because we sometimes depend on our might. Israel did. And you know what happened? They had might but not right, and they ended up in trouble. And we need to realize our dependency is on the Lord. Let's give another indicator of our nation's heritage. Let's say that I, I called uh, a senator, and I said, I, you know, the Capitol building has so much room in it. Right in the center there, why don't we start holding worship services there? What do you think would happen? It's kind of interesting because... The original, when they built the Capitol, they said, the politicians of that day said, you know, there's no church near us. We need to have worship services for people. Oh, we just built the Capitol building. Look at all that room. And so they started holding worship services in the Capitol building. In 1803, U.S. Senator John Quincy Adams confirmed there's no church of any denomination, we need to have worship. So on December 4th, 1800, Congress approved the use of the Capitol building as a church building. Did you get that? Who approved it? Congress approved the use of the Capitol building as a church. Is there any confusion about that? No, look it up. You'll find it on Go Google. It'll help you. And, and so... What did they do? They said, we, we've got to do this. The approval of the capital for church was given by both the House and the Senate, with House approval being given by Speaker of the House, Theodore Sedwick, and the Senate approval being given by the President of the Senate, Thomas Jefferson, who they said was the least spiritual of the Founding Fathers. Yet he is voting that they use the Capitol building for a place of worship. And interesting, when he did that, he had already been voted in as President. He was just waiting to assume the office. Did you know something else Congress did? Congress said, these people in our land need the scriptures. And at that day, the only place that the scriptures were being printed was England. And Congress said, we need to put the scriptures in the hands of American citizens so they might know God and fear God. You think that's a good idea? That's what they did. And so they, they started this, this uh, 
thing about the scriptures. And in 1782, they approved a printing of the Bible. I think they paid for it too. There, there was no deficit, so they could pull that off. And they printed, and I have, this is a copy of that first set, and it said approved and recommended by the Congress of the United States, 1782. You see, people say this nation has been richly blessed, and it has. But you know why this nation has been richly blessed? It's been richly blessed because by and large, the people of this nation were Christian. And they upheld Christian values. And they taught their children those Christian values. And the land was made strong. Now let me ask you a question. How's it going today? How's it going today? You know, when I went to school, public school, we used to pray, and our teacher would read the Bible. Anybody remember that? Yeah, you all have to be over 30, right? Over 40, over 50. It, it wasn't even an issue at all until 1962. That means all those years, the Bible was in the public school, prayer was in the public school. It wasn't even an issue until 1962. And let me ask you a question. Any historian among us would say, since 1962, which way has our nation gone? Down, down. And public schools, the, you know, it went from chewing gum to drugs. Things have changed, haven't they? But one of the reasons they've changed is those who claim to know the Lord aren't living and bold for the Lord. And we need to be speaking out. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. This week, I don't know if you saw it, but uh, there was a Senate hearing to confirm one of President Trump's appointees, a guy named Russell Vaught, for the, for the second in command of the Office of Management and Budget. Now, what do you think a person who's going to command or work second in command of the Office of Management and Budget, what do you think he should know about? Money, right? How to count, how to add, how to put it together. Well, he was second in command. And uh, he came under attack in that hearing. Do you know why? He was a Bible-believing Christian. Listen to the, the article here written by Tony Perkins, June 8, 2017. Russell Vault, Donald Trump's choice for the agency's second in command, was in for a surprise yesterday when his confirmation was debated in the U.S. Senate. The conversation, which should have been about Vault's economic experience, turned fiercely personal thanks to Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders. Oh, you've heard of him. I see. Instead of big picture financials, the debate became a firefight over Vault's Christian faith. At issue was a column Vault wrote last year suggesting that Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. Quoting the piece, Sanders launched his first missile. Incidentally, I, I recorded this to watch it, so it took place. Sanders, Muslims do not simply have a deficient theology. They do not know God because they've rejected Jesus Christ, his son, and they stand condemned. Do you believe that that statement is Islamic phobic? And this Vault, Absolutely not, Senator. I am a Christian. I believe in a Christian set of principles based on my faith. Sanders, forgive me. We just don't have a lot of time. Do you believe people in the Muslim religion stand condemned? Is that your view? Fault. Again, Senator, I'm a Christian. I wrote that piece in accordance with the statement of faith at Wheaton College. Sanders, I understand that. I don't know how many Muslims there are in America. Maybe a couple million. Are you suggesting that these people stand condemned? What about Jews? Do they stand condemned too? Senator, I'm a Christian. Sanders shouting, I understand you're a Christian, but this country is made up of people who are not just. I understand that Christianity is the majority religion. 
But there are other people of different religions in this country and around the world. In all your judgment, do you think that people who are not Christians are going to be condemned? Vault. Thank you for probing on that question. As a Christian, I believe that all individuals are made in the image of God and are worthy of dignity and respect, regardless of their religious belief. I believe that as a Christian, that's how I should treat all individuals. Sander, do you think that's respectful of other religions? I would simply say, Mr. Chairman, that this nominee is really not someone who this country is supposed to be about. Let me ask you a question. How tolerant was Mr. Sanders? He said, if you don't believe like I believe, your opinion doesn't matter. Whereas Mr. Vault said, I respect everybody because that's the way God would have us treat people. And, and, and this is interesting. So he goes on to say this, the author of the article, just because Christians believe that Jesus, what Jesus said about man's spiritual destiny, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, doesn't mean they think other faith groups have no rights. Did you know that the only nations where other faith groups are free is Christian nations? Try going to Iraq and preaching Christianity. Try going to an atheist nation and preach Christianity. How long do you think you'll be preaching? Right? The only nation where people that we may disagree with enjoy great freedoms are nations where Christ is honored and where we are taught to be respectful and kind and listen to other people. And so we need to be careful. Listen, I pray that our nation seeks a true revival. And here's how it happens. When God's people live like God's people, this guy, as he's being hammered by Sanders, displayed Christian courtesy and kindness and chose his words well. We as a group of people need to unapologetically declare that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. And then we need to live it in such a way that no one can throw rocks at our life because we are mixed up in the culture so badly that no one can tell the difference between one who loves Christ and one who doesn't. And then we can see our nation swinging in a different direction because we will give people something to follow because the reality is men and women are looking for something. And here it is. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And he has rescued me, and he has rescued you, and we have a message for a dying world. The Romans goes on to say in chapter 11, verse 19, then you will say, branches were broken off so I might be grafted in. This is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. We as a nation, we claim to be Christian people. We need to have an impact on the nation in which we live because God comes to a point where he says the iniquity is full. Let's pray that there is a revival and a reversal and God's holy people live that way in the discourse of life so that God is able to bring blessing upon each one of us. Let's pray together. Father, help us to be very secure in our faith. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. And Lord, let us live out our lives in such a way that brings glory to you so that you may bring blessing to our land. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you and God bless you.